Hey, good morning. I'm Dr. Steve Stites, Chief Medical <laughs> Officer at the University of Kansas Health System. This is Open Mics with Dr. Stites. You don't have to be a doctor to know the suffix I-T-I-S, itis. Itis means inflammation. Words with itis like bronchitis, hepatitis, arthritis means something is inflamed. And I'm not talking about my wife being mad at me in the morning, like maybe this morning. Generally speaking, inflammation is a good thing. It's your immune system at work responding to a trigger. But too much inflammation can hurt and even kill you. We have three different health system doctors joining me today to talk about inflammation. Dr. Matt Shoemaker, on my left, specializes in infectious disease. Dr. Selena Gear, awesome, I said it right this time, is an allergist <laughs> at immunology. I've known her for like 20 years, I still can't say it right. And Dr. Winston Dunn is a gastroenterologist of GI doc. More specifically, he's a liver transplant specialist. These are three awesome physicians. Here's the best part today, guys. I'm not just a host, I'm a patient. I may even see one of the fine physicians up here. And the best part even beyond that, I have three physicians, no copay. How about that? Dr. Shoemaker, talk to us a little bit about what inflammation really is. What's happening in your body that is inflammation? So from, from our standpoint with the patients we see from, with infectious diseases, inflammation is the body's first line of defense against germs, bacteria, viruses, uh, where your white blood cells try to defend itself uh, from these pathogens and quell uh, the invasion. Um, typically, this goes unnoticed. I mean, this is happening all throughout the day. You know, we're being insulted by bacteria, uh, and most of the time it goes unnoticed. Sometimes it can be uh, significant. You get a boil or even severe sepsis. Dr. Gear, in your world, <clears throat> inflammation doesn't only be relate to infection. It could be other things as well. That's right, your inflammatory system, um, the immune response that you get could be due to an infection, but it could also be due to, um, say, an allergic reaction. If you are allergic to cat dander or ragweed pollen and you get the inflammation in your skin, your eyes, your nose, and even in your lungs, where you have an inflammatory response generated by your immune system in response to an allergic trigger. Um, same can happen for foods uh, or other things you might be allergic to this time of the year we get a lot of patients complaining about poison ivy rash and that too is inflammation your body is reacting to the exposure to the plant so seasonal allergies is that inflammation in some ways absolutely uh, your immune system generates uh, chemicals and recruits cells into the area that generate those inflammatory responses and we use medications to help uh, calm down that inflammatory response and there are certain cells that are causing the inflammation which cells are those typically your white blood cells, but there are several different types of white blood cells. And the different types of white blood cells might be employed in different types of inflammation. For example, in allergic inflammation, we get a lot of mast cells and eosinophils that partake in that inflammatory response. And there's both acute and chronic inflammation. Talk to us a little bit about that. So acute inflammation would be something from a, an injury that happens very quickly. Let's say you twist your ankle and you suddenly get that redness, warmth, and swelling in that area, and that is because of the acute injury. Same thing if you cut yourself or burn yourself or have one of those allergic triggers. Sometimes the inflammation starts and doesn't stop. And that can happen in patients with autoimmune disease or maybe celiac disease, where the inflammatory trigger continues to cause inflammation or your body's actually using that inflammation as um, a process in attacking itself maybe an autoimmune disease like lupus or rheumatoid arthritis. And that inflammatory response can be very dangerous, like you said, cause harm and maybe even death if, if left untreated. So Dr. Dunn, sometimes this affects organs like the liver. Talk to us about what happens when that goes on. Well, inflammation in the liver is very common. And often the inflammation is silent until it is very late. Uh, and uh, causes uh, very serious uh, damage. The most uh, common uh, cause of uh, inflammation uh, is uh, caused uh, by uh, metabolic uh, conditions and uh, uh, we uh, call this uh, non-alcoholic uh, fatty liver disease 
and it affects about 25 uh, percent of the population which is caused by uh, obesity uh, and uh, diabetes. Uh, the uh, second uh, most uh, common uh, uh, cause uh, of uh, inflammation uh, in the, the uh, liver uh, is uh, caused uh, by uh, alcohol. Uh, as we know, uh, about uh, uh, five percent of the populations in the uh, United States have alcohol use disorder. But interestingly, uh, only uh, Fifteen percent of the population uh, develop uh, cirrhosis, uh, and uh, there's genetic factor. Uh, but it's uh, also uh, those uh, with uh, obesity uh, and uh, diabetes uh, that is uh, at uh, additional risk of uh, developing cirrhosis when they consume uh, alcohol. And then finally, uh, hepatitis uh, C uh, is also uh, a condition that is uh, readily uh, treatable. Uh, but uh, we need uh, to screen uh, for these uh, conditions. Uh, but uh, the key message uh, is that uh, information in li the liver is uh, often uh, uh, silent uh, and uh, does not uh, have uh, any uh, symptoms, but uh, we can uh, screen for these uh, conditions. So, man, is, is inflammation always bad? Because sometimes we need inflammation to respond to an infection. No, I mean, the, the inflammation you get when uh, you're exposed to a new infection is is good inflammation in that your body's trying to protect you. Uh, the problem is when it goes unchecked. So as soon as the inflammation starts, there are mechanisms where the body tries to slow down or decrease that inflammation so there's not too much additional damage. So in the long run, so inflammation can be good, it can be bad. So <clears throat> how do we know, how does the body keep inflammation regulated so it isn't a bad form of inflammation, Dr. Gear? And because I think it sometimes kind of goes a little haywire. Yeah, so just like we have these mechanisms to ramp up the inflammatory response when we need to respond to an infection or an injury, we also have the same kind of response to check that back, to bring that back into a normal range when we no longer need that immune response to happen. Um, that helps us so that we don't generate over inflammation or excessive inflammation that then can go on to cause damage to our bodies. And in fact, there are, talk to us about some of the different kinds of diseases that can cause Cause the bad kinds of inflammation, Dr. Kier. So one one process that I work with is asthma. So asthma in response to infections, in response to exercise, or maybe even airborne allergens, this time of the year pollen. Uh, when you get too much inflammation in the chest as a response to those exposures, then you end up with symptoms like wheezing, chest tightness, cough, and we have to give you medications to calm down that inflammation that has, has become overreactive. You know, it is interesting that something can be so good, can be so bad, all at the same time. You've named some disease, you've named some diseases. In your world, we call it sepsis, I think. Talk to us a little bit about what we that do. could be. Uh, so sepsis is when uh, you get an infection and your immune system starts to ramp itself up to fight that infection. Uh, and, and one of the things I think people miss, and I, I tell the students this, is when you have sepsis from, say, E. coli, it's not the E. coli that kills you, it's your immune response because it's gone into overdrive uh, and you're producing all of these uh, inflammatory proteins that, that cause you to have leaky blood vessels, have decreased blood pressure, and have organ damage. And you can tamp down some of those things. What do we do to tamp it down and try and keep it quiet? So we have lots of medication options to help calm down inflammation, things like steroids. Um, we have a whole line of products called monoclonal antibodies that we use in severe cases of inflammation that can focus on one small piece of your immune system and help um, bring that back into check so that the inflama inflammation is uh, regulated more. Those medications um, have broadened their scope into diseases of the GI tract, asthma, skin allergies, autoimmune disease, um, and we're very fortunate to practice medicine in a day where we have these monoclonal antibodies that can very narrowly improve our immune system's response, bringing that over excessive inflammation back into, um, into a regulated state. It is interesting, uh, but speaking of in these days, we have these, uh, when I started in medicine back when there were still icebergs in Missouri and Kansas, you know, um, we had prednisone and Benadryl, and that was about it, and we didn't have a lot of success sometimes with those things. It's come a heck of a long way since then. Okay, here's my consultation part. 
So a few years ago, thanks to the fine GI physicians here at the University of Kansas, I, um, I was having symptoms with all this kind of funny bunny abdominal pain. And I thought, you know, eh, it's just stress, it's this or that. And man, sometimes I'd have really, you know, explosive stool, sometimes I'd get constipated, sometimes I'd have funny, but, and I saw one of your fine folks and they said, you know, you need to try this low FODMAP gluten-free diet. And like, whatever, that's just dumb. Gluten-free diet, I'm no, I don't have a gluten allergy, that's just dumb. And then I thought, you know, gluten, this, low, this low gluten thing, that's just a fad and it's, you know, it's, it's not really, I don't need to do that. But the symptoms got bad enough, I finally decided to do it and dang, if it didn't work. But because I love bread, and because I especially love biscuits with peach, peach jam or strawberry jam or cherry jam or sometimes all three, a little bit of butter, I'm getting hungry, um, I didn't want to give it up. So I gave it up and, I've, and, and my, symptoms all, or I, my symptoms went away and then I started eating again and they all came back. But because I'm stubborn, I said, you know what, I don't believe it. And so I stopped it and I felt better. I started it again and it all came back. And now I've gotten gluten free and I feel better than I've felt in years. Okay, Dr. Gear, am I crazy? No, um, we uh, sort of segregate our wheat sensitivities into three categories. Patients with true celiac disease where they can't ingest any gluten product, they really have to concentrate on reading labels. Those people who are wheat sensitive where eating a loaf of bread makes them feel terrible. Or patients who have uh, wheat allergy where you actually truly cannot have any exposure because when you do, you develop not the GI symptoms of celiac disease necessarily, but hives, difficulty breathing, throat swelling, anaphylaxis, those severe, potentially life-threatening allergic reactions. Um, and it's really important for patients to seek out the attention of a physician when they're trying to figure out what category they fit into. So Dr. Dunn, is it okay if I blame you for my gluten um, allergy or insensitivity or inflammation or whatever it is? Can I blame you for that? <laughs> well, I mean, I certainly uh, agree uh, with uh, the approach of uh, being on a uh, gluten-free uh, uh, um, diet to, for the treatment uh, of uh, the uh, celiac uh, disease. I mean, not celiac disease, but uh, irritable bowel uh, syndrome because uh, the uh, gluten-free approach is a very important uh, 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 component of the low FODMAP uh, diet, which is the treatment of the irritable bowel syndrome. Yeah, and just, to, just for y'all, it worked for me a couple of times since I was stubborn, had to keep repeating the experiment to see if it really worked, if that was really the case, because I, I love bread. So, all right, Winston, or Dr. Dunn, you mentioned a few minutes ago about this kind of epidemic between diabetes, obesity, and non-alcoholic fatty liver. And you then said, really, that's inflammation. Why do we have inflammation in that setting? What's going on there? Well, uh, the uh, <coughs> diabetes uh, and uh, uh, obesity uh, and other uh, metabolic uh, components uh, such as uh, hypertension uh, uh, and uh, uh, hyperlipidemia, uh, that is high cholesterol, uh, has a uh, common uh, uh, denominator, which is uh, insulin uh, resistance, uh, which is uh, very uh, inflammatory. Uh, and uh, it uh, results uh, in uh, inflammation uh, in uh, the body uh, that uh, affects uh, uh, many organ systems uh, that uh, does not limit uh, to the liver, uh, but uh, uh, to uh, other organs uh, such as uh, our, our cardiovascular uh, systems. Uh, and uh, if you are a, a kidney specialist, uh, you may uh, have uh, um, a kidney uh, disease uh, from uh, diabetes uh, and uh, so on. Uh, so you have uh, inflammation uh, uh, all over uh, the uh, body. And if you are an uh, infectious uh, disease uh, specialist, we understand uh, that uh, those uh, with uh, obesity and diabetes are also uh, at uh, risk of uh, developing uh, very uh, severe uh, COVID uh, when they uh, have one. So uh, increased uh, inflammation. Um. So just in full disclosure, I may have had a little bit of whiskey last night and I felt a little terrible after that. Is that inflammation or bad whiskey? I don't know. I think it is uh, bad uh, whiskey because okay. as we know, <laughs> uh, Dr. Uh, Stice uh, has uh, ideal body weight. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if that's still true. It was true at one point in my life. Okay, Dr. Shoemaker, COVID-19 is an infectious disease, yet there's a lot of inflammation that goes along with that. Talk there to is. us. Um, and we are still not fully clear on why there's so much more inflammation, say, with COVID-19 than with influenza. Uh, but we, we do know and we have seen that 
as with other inflammatory things that we've talked about, some of the patients who get COVID-19 have severe inflammation to the point where their immune system basically goes off the rails and then we have to give them medicines to try to counter their immune system uh, to see if we can help with their outcomes. Um, it's basically like you took the governor if you remember what a governor is for your car, maybe when you were 16. I'll say, are you going to go political on me right now? Because no, we no. got to be really careful with that. I was yeah. thinking, Stay in your lane. like, when you were 16, you probably had a lead foot, and your dad probably put a governor, which was probably a block yeah. of wood. He screwed I under was, your gas. I was a nerd, dude. That so, was not you. I didn't okay. have a bow tie. Mm. <laughs> but anyway, take the governor off, and the immune system just goes bonkers. I can't, my car, if I accelerated too fast, it just died. So there was really no, there was no worry about that. That's another story for another time. Hawkeye, you and I have been talking about uh, this call immunization, inflama inflammation mm -hmm. thing. All these people are afraid that immunization was going to cause terrible inflammation mm -hmm. and lead to sudden death. I mean, I don't think we're seeing that. No, not at all. You know, and again, there's been more. More and more studies looking at the safety, not only of the first monovalent vaccines, but also now these new bivalent vaccines as well. And, and just as Dr. Shoemaker said, you know, we are exposed to so many different pathogens or so many different antigens uh, every day that our immune system is constantly working. And also to Dr. Shoemaker's point as well, um, there is, you know, one of the theories behind long COVID also is some sort of continued inflammatory process going on, helping to cause those symptoms uh, for people. Uh, the mechanisms are not fully elucidated yet, but that is one of the one of the theories, and it's probably a couple different theories as to why long COVID continues, or really any other long symptoms after viral illness, Dr. Stites, because you've, you've talked about uh, how people can have symptoms even after other viral illnesses or severe infection as well. Yeah, it is, it is a problem. Okay, so we're going to get to a COVID count in just a moment, but I want to have a kind of a question just around the table we think of inflammation, you have it or you don't, or is it really just kind of a little bit more of a spectrum in which sometimes you have more of it and sometimes you have less of it? Yeah, I would say everyone has some level of immune activation, depending on what your exposures are, what's going on as far as if you have any infections, but it is when your immune system loses that checkpoint that it becomes dangerous. So I think it's a balance. Our immune system is always primed to respond. It's always ready to respond, but um, it's not always responding if it doesn't have something to make it do so. So checkpoint, governor, I like this kind of language. So this language we can all get around, get our heads around a little bit. Dr. Dunn, what do you think about this question of a lot of inflammation or just a little bit of inflammation? Now, so from the liver perspective, uh, your fatty liver and a little bit of uh, inflammation uh, in the uh, liver uh, is uh, very common. Uh, and uh, in fact, uh, it really depends on the different uh, uh, thresholds uh, being used or different uh, tests uh, being used uh, that it can be detected uh, in uh, the uh, liver. Uh, so what is uh, important uh, is uh, uh, which uh, patients are really uh, at risk uh, for developing uh, advanced uh, liver uh, disease. Because in the populations, actually, 25% uh, uh, of the population have a fatty uh, liver. Uh, and from the uh, perspective of uh, a liver specialist, our job is uh, really to identify a subset of a patient that is at risk of uh, developing uh, advanced uh, liver disease. Uh, we call this uh, fibrosis. And in the populations, about uh, two to three percent of the populations are uh, having advanced fibrosis, and uh, one percent of the populations have a really bad disease called uh, cirrhosis. Uh, and we call this uh, process a risk stratification of identifying this uh, subset of patients that have a progressive uh, disease. Yeah, it's an interesting, it's a whole thing is pretty interesting, the spectrum around it. And um, it's amazing how little things like going gluten free or uh, changing other habits and or seasonality can really affect the degree of inflammation you have in your body. All right, well, if you have questions this morning, please send us into the chat on, on um, Facebook and YouTube or tweet, on it, tweet to us or email the Medical News Network. You'll find those links right here on your screen. Let's turn now to Dr. Dana Hawkinson, Medical Director of Infection Prevention and Control. I don't even know that name. It's really Hawkeye. How is our COVID count, yeah. Hawk? 
Yeah, it's good. I think I think we have a, a good lucky panel keeping our numbers down. I think that's what it is. Right now we have 27 total, but only 11 active. Unfortunately, though, Steve, um, high proportion of severe illness there, five in the ICU and one on the ventilator. So I think we have continued to say that with individual immunity from vaccination and from infection and reinfection, but also then that contributing to population immunity. What we are really seeing now is the continued progress of this disease becoming more a disease of those uh, those people with significant risk factors such as age, immune compromise, things of that nature. I would bet that most of those people with the severe illness in the ICU certainly have one, two, or three uh, or more of those risk factors for severe disease. Hawk, you know, um, <clears throat> there's been some attention recently drawn to this question of since masks came off in hospitals, yeah. have we seen a rise in hospital transmission mm -hmm. of COVID? I, we, we watch our numbers. I don't think we've seen that. Yeah, no, this is one of the things that our infection prevention nurses uh, and team continually monitor, and we have not seen uh, any rise or really any cases that we know of, of hospital-acquired uh, COVID-19. And again, we have a, a vast network to identify hospital-acquired infections, and we haven't seen that at all. What we have seen is it's been safe. I know that when we've talked with other CMOs as well, they haven't seen that rise. So, so far, it has been safe. Now, again, we will probably continue this practice of no masking, um, you know, data certainly support that uh, until we get to the, the winter months and we'll have to take it step by step and see exactly what we do. We know some of our units here, especially those with uh, severe immune compromise like the BMT units, bone marrow transplant units, uh, do normally mask during those winter months as well. Yeah, and that makes sense because there's lots of diseases that can mm -hmm. be spreading right then, but I think we're doing pretty well right now. Our numbers yeah. are down significantly. The numbers in the community are down significantly. And I think there, there was a lot of spread. It wouldn't just be limited to hospitals, right? It would be in grocery stores. It would be in, 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 in mm -hmm. any place where people are indoors. And, and so I, I don't, that's not what the numbers reflect throughout our community. This is, again, a good time is COVID-19 looks like it's morphing and, and coming on this uh, into more of a seasonal disease. You know, that's what we're thinking and hoping certainly for the first two years it wasn't. Uh, but again, I think going back to individual immunity that contribute to population immunity, I think we are and we are believing that it's going to be more of a seasonality like the other respiratory viruses, probably still going to have higher circulation even during the, the, the warm months compared to those other things like influenza uh, and the common cough and cold coronaviruses. But we are hoping it will be more of a, a seasonality thing. And that way when the recommendations come out for, with boosters to help protect against severe disease and hospitalization, people can time those boosters appropriately. This is awesome having all these smart folks in the room with me today and having a couple of ID docs all together. Golly, yeah. I think we, we just we got a lot of knowledge in the room here, Jill. I hope there's some great questions out there from our community to take on the, these excellent folks. Actually, there are. Um, and I'm going to start with the first one because I think you and I are in the same boat, not to overshare. Uh -oh, and they recently okay. put me on a, if I'm gonna say that, I heard you say it and I want you to explain FODMAP diet. Low FODMAP diet. Yeah, I went with low FODMAP. Is that what you, did you do that too? What, what is it though? Yeah, so I mean, explain. It, you guys, you may explain it better than I can, Winston, but or Dr. Dunn, but I think it's essentially there are these oligosaccharides that are that we eat in our foods, and there are certain foods and like garlic, onions, um, and, and there there are complex form of sugar that our bodies have a little bit of a hard time breaking down. They sit in the stomach and they kind of ferment, and they cause some gas and some disruption to the lining of your, especially your small intestine and large intestine, and when that happens, you just feel funny. How's that for a lung doctor's explanation? Not bad. Uh, yes, uh, that is a wonderful explanation. Uh, so uh, the treatment uh, for the irritable uh, bowel uh, syndrome uh, includes uh, medications uh, and uh, diet, uh, the uh, low FODMAP uh, diet, uh, which is uh, eliminating uh, the uh, uh, certain kinds of uh, complex uh, uh, sugar uh, oligosaccharide uh, and uh, also uh, using uh, probiotics, uh, so one of the uh, uh, three components uh, of the treatment uh, for the irritable bowel syndrome. Yeah, what I did, you know, I, gave, I went, uh, I gave up dairy, I like milk, I love ice cream, but I, for years I've not felt good after I ate ice cream because, you know, once again, I like to prove myself these things over and over and over and over and over, over again. So I gave up dairy, gave up the high um, oligosaccharides, and I gave up gluten. 
And then like three or four months later, I was like a new person. I couldn't believe how much better I feel. And now I know if I have any gluten because my joints hurt. It's the weirdest thing. And then my gut hurts. I'm like, okay, I, I, I may be a little slow to get educated, but I can eventually figure the association out. So Jill, I, I think it's worked great. I've had a few patients I've tried it on in my clinic, the, uh, my CF clinic, and um, CF patients have some GI symptoms anyway that are a little difficult sometimes, but man, they felt so much better with that. And some of them really, their joint pain really resolved. So I don't know, I'm all about it and, and, it, and it helped me. I'm sure it's not for everyone. There's some great apps out there though that can help you guide you through what a low FODMAP diet looks like. Have you started your uh, diet? Well. I, I, I'm going to have to do that thing because I'm struggling with it a little bit. Um, I'm by trial and error. My husband put garlic and onions in the meal last night. He cooked, and right away, right away. Yep. And so that leads to Robbie and my next question. I don't remember having this trouble when I was younger. Is it age related, or am I just not tolerating it as well anymore? Uh, it's age related for me, although I never did well <laughs> with garlic and onions, but go ahead. There's a lot of ideas about why we're starting to develop more sensitivity. Perhaps it's the way our food is processed. Perhaps it's the way um, we eat. We're so busy, we're on the go. So a lot of times we're eating much more processed food than organic or more raw foods. Um, we also have altered our diets. We have a lot less fresh fruits and vegetables in our in our daily meals and so making sure that when you are sort of re-looking at your diet what what are you eating on a daily basis that you are including proper amounts of fiber making sure you're drinking plenty of water and maybe not excessively indulging in those biscuits and and jellies yeah, i just gave it up because i feel so much better when i don't have it here the other thing you'll hear about is shop around the edge of the grocery store don't shop in the center of the grocery store because then you're getting all the fresher food vegetables here's a funny story so for years my sister has been vegetarian and i've always made fun of her i'm like yeah be kidding me who could do that I'm I am I am a carnivore and so now I eat a vegan breakfast mm. a vegan lunch mm. with tofu mm. and now I actually have gotten to stir frying my tofu in different kinds of olive oil because it actually tastes pretty good when you do that and um, I can't I feel great mm. unfortunately the side effect is I put on about 20 pounds I think I absorb stuff I don't know what happened something changed in my whole life it was just like what a difference it made so I just but I think it's a really great thing and I've, I've not felt better and, and I've not had to see you for a little while because I feel so good <laughs> Gene wants to ask, hi Gene, um, glad to see that you're still with us. Uh, he wants to know, explain how inflammation causes low blood pressure, does it? Low blood pressure, okay, that's interesting. Go for so that I one. think what he may be referring to is in sepsis, uh, where you have severe, uh, extremely high levels of inflammation, your white blood cells uh, produce these, these proteins that cause your vessels to be leaky, and you have this phenomenon uh, we call third spacing. So if you ever had the misfortune of having a loved one in the ICU, you see how they become very swollen and that's what's happening. Your body's not able to keep the extra fluid within the vessels and it just goes out into the tissue. Uh, and that's because of uh, the effect from the proteins that are being released from the white blood cells yeah. in response to usually a bacteria, but it could be a virus or it could be a completely autoimmune phenomenon. And sometimes the, the, you actually, the blood vessels themselves lose their ability to constrict and they dilate and then they start third space. So it's, yep. a, it's a tough challenge in the ICU, a real tough challenge up in the ICU. And that also happens in the allergic reaction, like anaphylaxis. One of the severe, potentially life-threatening components of a severe allergic reaction, say to a peanut allergy patient, is that they do drop their blood pressure as part of the inflammatory response. Um, Interesting. Jeremy wants to know, and this is a great question, how can you tell if you're having a helpful inflammation response because your body is protecting you versus a reaction because you're doing something you haven't learned yet to avoid, like eating foods that you have a sensitivity to? All right, Dr. Kira, take us home here on this question. <laughs> so remember, again, inflammation is good when we need it, but if you are having reactions to, say, foods, it's really important to discern what symptoms you're having. So are you having hives? Are you having throat swelling? Are you having breathing problems or other rashes? That may require allergy testing. Uh, we really want patients to understand, like Dr. Seitz has suggested, that 
food allergies, true food allergies occur with every single exposure. So it's not a, I can eat some of it, or I can eat it a little bit here and there, and then I go back to avoiding it, but then I can go back to eating it. It really does, if you're having a true food allergy, need to be reproducible symptoms with every single exposure. If you have those reproducible symptoms, it's probably wise to talk to your doctor or maybe even see an allergist to get further testing to decide, is that a particular problem for you? We often want to hone in on what particular foods are causing problems. So maybe keeping a food diary can be very helpful to say, is it the garlic? Is it wheat? Is it milk products? What is specifically causing you to have problems? And those dietary elimination trials are also very helpful. So going off of that particular food for a couple weeks, seeing how you feel, maybe reintroducing it in small quantities and see how you feel. And then like Dr. Stite suggested, maybe even repeating that. Now, if you have hives or difficulty breathing or throat swelling, those more severe allergic symptoms, you need to be seen by an allergist as soon as possible excuse me, as soon as possible so that we can determine what food is causing that problem to help you learn how to avoid it and make sure you have the medications to treat for accidental exposures. Dr. Gears, my doctor, and I love her, just in full disclosure. <laughs> and I think this you've told me before, <laughs> I know, she treats my daughter too, she's amazing. I think you've told me before, a food diary is, is sometimes helpful too when you're trying to figure all that out. You have to be a little bit detective for yourself sometimes. Um, I want to say hi to Joellen. It, it feels like old home week. I, I should come on more often so I can see all my friends. She wants to know about a year ago, I experienced an allergic reaction to amoxicillin after never having a problem before. She writes, I am over 70 years of age. Why did my immune system suddenly decide to go haywire? I developed a rash and terrible itching. So these are the questions that we ask ourselves as allergists every day. Uh, why do patients suddenly develop an allergic reaction to something they've been exposed to multiple times? And the reality is you'll never develop an allergic reaction after your first exposure. Your body needs an exposure to then develop the sensitivity so that the second time or the 52nd time you develop an allergic reaction. So we don't know why that happens. If we could, I would probably win a Nobel Prize, um, but we don't understand why that happens, but if it does happen, you need further testing to determine. Additionally, uh, many patients will lose their sensitivity to certain things. Penicillin is a great one that patients lose their sensitivity. In fact, 80% of patients will lose their sensitivity to penicillin within 10 years. So all those 70 year olds out there who had an allergic reaction back when they were a child, it's time to get tested. And there are fortunately a lot of choices besides amoxicillin. There are a host of other choices besides amoxicillin, but you know, one thing we talk about drug allergies is sometimes you just have to explore the nature of the allergy. Um, a lot of things that we run into in day-to-day -day clinical practice are not truly allergies, they're more uh, intolerances. Yeah, and I would, I would add to, you know, Dr. Gear and I have worked on many cases where there are patients who say they have an allergy because they have a reaction, it doesn't necessarily uh, mean that it, they can't ever use that drug again. And Dr. Shoemaker and I see this every day in our practice. And so it is very important for us to get to the bottom of what is the reaction that you had and to what medicine, because some of these medicines, like the beta-lactams, like penicillin and amoxicillin, are some of the best drugs that we have to make you better. And so we don't wanna take that out of our uh, armamentarium to make you better. So uh, it is, uh, it's a lot of work and it's a lot of discussion with the patients and, and Dr. Shoemaker and I want to be able to use the best drug to help treat you and certainly we talk with Dr. Gear about that so we can uh, create a path forward to be able to do that as well. It, and Dr. Gear and her colleagues can help us where they can desensitize somebody to uh, say penicillin by giving them small doses and incrementally increasing it so that they develop a tolerance for it so that we can use it for a short term if they have a severe infection. Jill Chadwick. Okay, Peg wants to know, please talk about Crohn's disease and its treatment. Okay. Crohn's that's like a whole show. <laughs> that's a whole show. I'm not sure we're going to get too far down that one because it's, that's, that's a story of itself, I think, Dr. Well, Dodd. many uh, new um, biological treatments uh, has uh, been uh, developed uh, for uh, 
Crohn's uh, disease, uh, and uh, if you have uh, Crohn's uh, disease, uh, I think you should uh, schedule an appointment uh, with our GI uh, colleague. I think the, uh, the most uh, remarkable uh, change uh, is uh, uh, the uh, change uh, to uh, a a uh, so-called uh, uh, step-down uh, treatment. Uh, historically, we use uh, the uh, step-up uh, treatment, uh, which uh, uh, gradually escalates uh, on uh, the uh, immunosuppressants, that is, uh, the treatments to suppress the immune uh, uh, system. Uh, but uh, the new approach uh, is uh, the uh, uh, step-down uh, treatment, uh, because uh, the new biologicals uh, has uh, less uh, side effect, uh, so uh, we hit uh, the information uh, very hard uh, to suppress it, uh, and uh, we uh, start uh, from uh, a, a very uh, maximal uh, immune suppression uh, to uh, clamp down to, uh, on to the information uh, and uh, um, suppress uh, the symptoms. Uh, and uh, when the symptoms uh, goes down, uh, then uh, we gradually uh, taper off. Vinrick right, wants. Vinrick says I am 63 years old, overweight, and have a fatty liver. What can I do to treat fatty liver in addition to losing weight? Can you that reverse That is a it? wonderful question. I love this question. Uh, so I think uh, the the first step I think uh, is uh, uh, should be uh, uh, risk uh, stratification to, to uh, understand uh, how uh, severe uh, the uh, disease uh, is. Uh, we uh, commonly use uh, a, a scoring uh, system uh, called uh, the uh, FIT4 uh, score, uh, which uh, is a combination of uh, a commonly available lab uh, with uh, the uh, AST, uh, ALT, uh, age, and uh, platelet, uh, and uh, to see uh, what is the likelihood uh, of uh, having a, a severe progressive uh, disease. Uh, if uh, the, uh, there is a, a good likelihood uh, of uh, having a severe disease, uh, then uh, perhaps uh, the patients will either need uh, further testing uh, or a liver uh, biopsy uh, before uh, just uh, simply uh, pro uh, proceeding uh, with uh, weight loss. Angela is acted, asking if reactive C protein is, um, has to do with inflammation. Dr. Kier, C-reactive protein. <laughs> so C-reactive protein is one of our inflammatory markers. There are two of them. The other one is called the SEDRATE or ESR. And these are blood tests that can help us determine how much inflammation there is in your body. Unfortunately, they are nonspecific, which means they can be elevated for uh, many reasons, including um, allergic reactions or hives, for example, infections, even certain cancers or autoimmune disease. We do use them as markers to help us understand how much inflammation uh, a patient has and if we're impacting that level of inflammation uh, with medication management. So they are something we use very commonly for many types of diseases. All right, and the last question goes to Julie, and she's really asking for a, um, a, an opinion on which doctor this patient should see. She describes him as a young man. He has elevated ALT, insulin, cholesterol, is obese with a 47-inch waist. He does not drink alcohol. She said, which specialist should he see? One doctor is saying an endocrinologist. It's probably Where not should just he start? One. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's probably not just mm -hmm. one, Dr. Dunn. I, I think I agree that uh, patients uh, may uh, need to see an endocrinologist, uh, and uh, um, the endocrinologist uh, typically uh, will uh, decide uh, if uh, the patient uh, uh, will need uh, to be uh, referred uh, to the uh, liver uh, specialist. Uh, I think that may be the yeah, best I think decision. That's, I think a good primary care physician is start who probably line up those appointments correctly. And it also depends on what the goal is. If there's underlying ch um, diseases causing the weight gain, that's one thing. It's an eating habit, that's a different thing. And it just depends on the clinical setting, right? It's like so much of medicine, it's hard to answer it um, uh, without knowing more of, of the full history. But uh, starting with a really good primary care physician is a great place to start on something like that. So let's get some final thoughts around the panel. <laughs> Dr. Gear, I'm gonna start with you. I think uh, one thing that we need to remember is inflammation is important when we need it. If you think you have inflammation for other reasons, it's important 
to sort of write down those symptoms that you think are driven by inflammation and make sure you're seeing the right type of, type of doctor like we spoke of. Um, your primary care doctor can help guide who you need to see for what symptoms you've developed. Um, and then, you know, diet being a very important part. We talk a lot about diet and how that impacts your overall health. Um, just making sure that patients are eating healthy and getting plenty of exercise is very important for your overall health for any inflammatory condition. Thank you. Dr. Dunn. Well, uh, we discuss about uh, inflammation uh, in the uh, liver, uh, and uh, it is uh, often uh, asymptomatic, um, but uh, it can be uh, screened for, and uh, this uh, can be accomplished uh, by your uh, primary uh, care uh, physician. Okay. Thank you. Dr. Shoemaker? Uh, you know, inflammation is one of the first lines of defense from your immune system, so inflammation is natural and it's good um, until it isn't. So too much inflammation is bad, uh, but we do need it for health and recovery when fighting infections and healing. Doc Hawk. Yeah, uh, just going to echo our, our great, uh, our great uh, panel there. So really not much to add, you know. It's always good, again, working with these docs and, and in our medical teams and certainly working day to day with Dr. Shoemaker and then also having those interactions with Dr. Dunn and Dr. Gear as well. All right, I want to thank everybody for being a part of this outstanding program today. I am reminded of something about the human condition, that the one constant amongst us is change. When I was a young man, I could drink whole milk and I drank with everything. Man, that was the best thing and I would have it on cereal and I would have a couple of glasses at dinner. Later on, I did a little 2%, finally some skim, didn't like skim. And now, here I am, that, uh, something happened when I was around 25 or 30, and now I drink darn oat milk and I feel fine. And if I drink whole milk, I feel terrible. You know what? There's a story here. Our bodies change over time, and how we respond to things change over time. Listen to your body, listen to the science, listen to hope and faith, and together, you can feel pretty darn good. Because inflammation is an important part of your life. You don't want to have to be dominating your life because that's when you feel really terrible. So listen to those good folks who are trying to give you the messages that even though you were one person once, you can be a different person today. Thanks again to everybody for joining. Thanks again to all of our guests. And for until next week, remember, it's always the same, faith, hope, and science. Thank you. Coming up tomorrow on the Morning Medical Update, a disease that starts in your bone marrow and can spread all over. AL amyloidosis is so rare, some doctors may never see a case. I'm Jessica Lovell on the next Morning Medical Update. The condition meant one man needed a new heart while still being treated for cancer. Meet him and the doctors who pulled it off, Thursday at 8 a.m. I'm Alexis Del Cid on the next All Things Heart. They did quintuple bypass and I'm like, oh, like I hadn't even heard of that. I thought quadruple was like the most you could do. A local drummer who skipped taking care of the most important beat, his heart. The emergency that brought him to the University of Kansas Health System for a quintuple bypass surgery, Thursday morning at 10. Subscribe to our Morning Medical Update and Open Mics with Dr. Stites podcasts. Now everywhere podcasts are available.